each one of us has made mistakes in our lives. I hope that each one of us also learns from them. And that's one of the things that I'd like us to be thinking about in this chapter on ethics, that certainly psychology and medicine and other uh, disciplines have made mistakes. But we are trying to do things better. We're trying to learn from our errors. So I'm going to talk about two different, well, four different studies um, where there have been ethical concerns. One was the Stanford Prison Experiment uh, by Haney et al. Uh, Zimbardo was one of the, the authors. Um, and what they did is they chose an, a number of healthy, college age uh, volunteers and assigned them randomly to either the uh, prison guard group or to the uh, prisoner group. And one of the things that they discovered is that in the course of that two week period that they had planned, by the end of six days, things were going pretty poorly. And in fact, at that point in time, they, uh, some of the guards were becoming extremely aggressive. Some of the prisoners were having a very difficult time um, sobbing in response to some of the interventions from the, the guards. And uh, one of the or one of the consultants to the project actually stepped in and said, "This is wrong," and stopped the experiment. And Zimbardo, at that point, you know, admitted that he had made a mistake in allowing allowing this to go forward to that degree. Now. He was interested in the role of the prison guards or how role of guard and prisoner played out in terms of prison violence. And so he certainly added some important kinds of things to the literature. One of our questions would be, is it worth it? Because there was probably significant cost for some of both the prisoner, prisoners and the guards. Now, a second study was done by the Sharifs. And what they did in the robber cave study is they assigned children to two different groups, asked them to com compete uh, for a larger goal. And the children um, escalated in aggression over the period. That aggression decreased only when they were asked to work together towards some larger goal. Communication didn't work. That wasn't sufficient. Now we have, let's look more closely at two other studies. The Tuskegee syphilis study was a study where looking or that used 600 black men, 400 or about 400 uh, who had syphilis, about 200 with, without syphilis. And the question was, I mean, at that point, we knew that penicillin could cure syphilis. But the question was, would it prevent syphilis? And the study was continued for a fair length of time without informing, um, informing the members of the study, um, without hearing them. So the participants weren't treated respectfully. They weren't informed of what was going on or what the consequences were, the risks were. They were in fact harmed. Um, and 
there was also the question of this is a targeted disadvantaged social group, you know, who may not have been able to say no. And that's something that we want, you know, to be able to have true informed consent in a study. The Milgram obedience studies, you know, we have a, a, an ethical balance that we need to be thinking about. Remember, this is a study where a, we have a teacher, learner, and experimenter. So the teacher is in the plaid shirt, the learner is in the suspenders and ties, and tie, and the experimenter is in the white lab coat. And the teacher was supposed to teach the learner a task by giving him a shock every time he made an error. Those shocks increased in, in intensity across the course of the study. And they increased to such a degree that they appeared to be lethal. Let me clearly say the learner was not shocked. He was a confederate of the experimenter. He was pretending that he was being shocked here. So first off, there's deception. And this is a, a place where the, the learner believes or the teacher believed that he was causing harm to the, to the learner. And about 66% of the participants went to the most significant, you know, to the strongest level of shock. So there was deception. They were exposed to extremely stressful situations. Milgram debriefed participants, but is debriefing going to be sufficient once you believe that you have actually done something you know, significant like this. They had the ability to withdraw, but the experimenter kept saying, please continue, please. Now, this study was done right after World War II. Um, and there was a question as to why uh, Nazi soldiers did some horrific things. And I think that's an important kind of question. Many people at that point had been saying, it's that the Nazis were bad people. And one of the things that Milgram's research suggests is that it wasn't that they were bad people, but that there was someone in authority telling them, this is what you need to do. There was something about the situation that encouraged people to obey even when they felt it was wrong. And so one of the questions here from an ethical perspective is how do we balance that, that risk? How do we protect our participants while also attempting to answer some really important questions? We're gonna continue these discussions over the next two videos and take care.